right, I am going to trust that GoTo webinar is doing its thing. Welcome to the Trimark, uh, first Trimark webcast of the year. My name is Daniel Kotsky. I am customer success manager and operations strategist here at Trimark Security. Thank you everybody so much for joining. Uh, I was just talking to Sean off uh, as we were kind of chatting amongst ourselves. And when I told him the registrants for this thing on Monday, there's you know, 20 some people. And then four days later, we're at over 130. There's 50 of you in here right now. Uh, thank you, couldn't be more thrilled about this. Uh, we are Trimark Security. Uh, we are a uh, professional services company based out of Washington, D.C. We do assessments. We are uh, not for nothing. We're the experts. We're the experts in Active Directory, Azure AD, of uh, VMware vSphere, and um, um, Attacker Tactics. That's what we do. That's our bread and butter. And um, that's what we're here to talk to you about today. And first of all, let me just assuage any, uh, any doubt uh, or any uh, nervousness. We have no slides. You're not getting pitched, right? You're not getting you're not getting shilled today. I'll shill to you some other time, but th this is an ask me anything. These this is our favorite stuff to do. Uh, we do we do these a lot. We've done these on Twitch, um, and we find it's best. Like you want to, we know stuff. You want to know stuff, and that's what we're gonna do. And without any further ado, um, we're gonna get right to it. We have so many questions to get to. Thank you. And by the way, you can raise your hand, uh, or you can uh, put questions in the chat. Um, to give us more questions. We'll try to get through as many as we can. Uh, Sean, I think we're gonna have to do another one of these uh, because there's so, so much and I couldn't be- We'll, we'll queue it up for tomorrow, for next, I was gonna say tomorrow. Our uh, next tomorrow. one, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> not on Sean Metcalf calendar or not. Um, <laughs> so very briefly, let me, uh, let me uh, introduce uh, your panelists. I'm going to turn my video off after this and let the experts handle this. We have uh, Scott Blake, uh, director of our services here at Trimark. Uh, he's the, I was gonna say the one with the glasses, but um, the one with the second best hair. Uh, I'll, I'll get to the best hair in a second. We also have Jake, uh, Jake Hildreth. He is uh, lead on our Active Directory uh, security assessment that we do. Uh, and he's here to answer your questions. And of course, the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Sean Metcalf. Uh, he is our founder, our CTO, one of a handful of Microsoft uh, Active Directory security certified masters in the entire world. If you're gonna have a question, Sean's gonna know about it. Uh, and aside from that, I am going to toss it over to the boys and we're gonna get started. Sean, I'll let you take it away. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Danny. So uh, we do a lot of assessments. We assess Active Directory, Azure AD, and as part of this, we have a good understanding of Active Directory and Azure AD, and we've seen a lot of real world environments from you know 100 users to about 900,000, some cases over a million user accounts in the, in the environment. Uh, we've seen a lot of interesting configurations. We've seen Forest with lots of domains up to, I think it was almost 80 that we had uh, assessed one time and some really interesting Azure AD environments. So yeah, let's let's get into the questions, Danny. Go ahead and uh, pick, pick some for us here. Oh God, we have so many. Uh, let me, where did my thing go? Uh, I, we have a big document that I'm opening up right now. Let us see. The first question is going to be, um, okay, you know what? Let's start here, Sean. Let's, before we dig into the weeds, before we really get into it, because uh, I, I, we always assume that everybody has a, a myriad of experience, right? You could, maybe you're just a one, step, one person shop and you're responsible for all this. How do you get the core concepts of AD security? Like, where does one start? Sure. Uh, so I'm going to be uh, the person that that points to his own website, adsecurity.org. It hasn't been updated in a while. Um, but really, anything Active Directory that is useful from the core concepts of Active Directory, those articles were written in 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003. Like, that's where those come from. Um, I actually, as part of the master program, went through and was asked to help update it for the 2012 uh, version of Windows. And so I went through and updated the reading list that was put together for those that were going into the program for 2012. Um, Microsoft decided to kill off the Microsoft Certified Master Program after rebranding it. Uh, but what that means is that I was able to take that reading list that I put together for the program and then share it with everyone. So that reading list of the core concepts of the things you really should know about with Active Directory are in adsecurity.org. 
Um, and we'll, we've been porting some of those things over to the Trimark Content Hub at hub.trimarksecurity.com, including all the new articles and, and great work that the Trimark team has been doing from a research perspective, uh, which includes SCCM, by the way. We, we have a, a member of our team, Brandon, who's uh, done some interesting research on SCCM and has published that. So uh, yeah, I would say learning about Active Directory really comes down to understanding authentication. Um, so I, I used to ask a, an interview question um, because I wanted to really probe for knowledge and, and figure out how much a person really understood about how things work. So my, my favorite interview question was, when a workstation boots up and someone logs on, what happens? So how are the domain controllers discovered? How does DNS work? What are the things that happen as part of that log on? Just anything that you can think of. And so a lot of the good answers that I got were, well, the workstation has to boot up, so it has to check in with AD. It does some DNS queries to find the domain controller to then provide the authentication, the user types and the username and password. There's checks to make sure the password works. Is it Kerberos or is it NTLM authentication? Uh, how, how those things end up fitting together. So from an Active Directory core concept, you're gonna think about authentication. Okay, how does Kerberos work? Um, there's plenty of articles you can type in, explain to me like it's like I'm five, Kerberos, uh, same thing with NTLM. But those are the sort of core concepts. And then from there, it comes down to group membership and understanding what are the privilege groups in Active Directory, what rights do they have? Uh, there's a couple articles on AD security about that. And then what are the other components? So one of the things that we find that's interesting in assessments is we find enterprise password vaults uh, of enterprise in the environments we see enterprise password vaults it's usually what jake cyber arc cyber arc exactly uh and how often do we find security issues with that configured enterprise password vault scott uh at least 95 percent of the time <laughs> not higher yeah so these are the things that actually connect into active directory and has either power because uh, and I'll quote Bain here, you think you have power over me? Yes, these things absolutely have power over Active Directory. So you have things like enterprise password vaults, you have agents on domain controllers, which we're looking at, you have systems like Azure AD Connect that have this kind of weird hybrid cloud connected thing between Azure AD and Active Directory, which just about every environment that we see has Azure AD Connect now. We look at that configuration from security perspective, and there are a lot of concerns when it comes to that. Scott wrote an article a couple of years ago about how to help secure Azure AD Connect. So yeah, I, I think from the core concepts at AD Security, AD Security.org, um, but there's also um, a lot of great folks on Twitter to follow that, that really are, have been pushing the boundaries of Active Directory uh, security. Um, someone figured out how to relay through Kerberos, which was thought to be impossible. And so things like that are pretty interesting and, and continue to push the boundaries of what we think is is possible or, or issues within Active Directory security. I like to say that we are finding that the things that were theoretical in the past are practical today. Um, for example, Kerberos was released, uh, I want to say 2015, it was, it was quite a while ago. And uh, at that point, we realized that, yes, you could actually figure out what a service count password was without any privilege access to the environment, without even really uh, performing a lot of network traffic on that network. Uh, so again, these these things that we've been talking about for years where service counts need to have long complex passwords, there's there's an attack tool that, that enables an attacker's ability to figure this out offline, like basically brute force the password offline. And then things like password spray show that if you have very bad passwords, they're gonna get discovered pretty quickly. So I, I think I think that question is is answered at this point. But uh, feel free to um, hit us up in the in in the add add some questions to uh, the question panel here, and uh, we'll we'll see what we can get to as far as good answers. Yeah, this you know honestly we should just do like a twenty four hour charity stream to get all these questions done because we're getting a lot of really good ones. Um, I do see yours, um, RK. We're gonna get to you in just a little bit. Uh, next one, I'll toss this up for any of our panelists. What are the most common uh, Active Directory and Azure AD security issues? Like, do you have ones that you know you almost see all the time or that just keep popping up? Oof. Say it, Scott. <laughs> yeah, I was trying, trying to think about which one I want to run with. Um, 
as Sean mentioned, I think Kerberosing is still very much alive and well. That's definitely one of the the higher priority findings that we come across. And, and a lot of times, you know, we're talking 20, 30, 40 accounts, you know, that are potentially Kerberosable. Um, I think we still see lower than lower than we would want to see, you know, domain and functional levels, operating systems installed on domain controllers. Um, yeah, it's these days it's a lot of integration too, which is something Sean hinted at. It's it's Active Directory certificate services, is Azure AD Connect, the things that plug into Active Directory that also come with um, some some caveats from a security perspective because they are usually pretty highly privileged and, and easily escalated. You know, once you get a certain level of access. I'm I'm curious what Jake wants to say. I was expecting you to say the uh, LDAP uh, channel binding is <laughs> finding missing. Up on that one. <laughs> We've seen it one time in uh, since I've been working for the company. So one time done correctly. Which is unfortunate, right? Because Microsoft initially wanted to enforce those settings through an update and then, you know, you get enough pushback and they're like, okay, we'll make this optional. But it, it really does come at the cost of security, which is unfortunate. So I'm going to piggyback that question and kick one to Jake. Uh, what are you seeing in the in the space of Active Directory certificate services? So when I was at Black Hat uh, last year, I chatted with some red teamers and I said, what are the two things that you go after and are most successful in compromising Active Directory? And they said Azure AD Connect and Active Directory certificate services, ADCS. We are finding at least one critical issue in almost every environment that we have uh, have assessed since we started assessing them November of 2021. Um, typically in escalation one, which is where a, you know, a regular user can just request their certificate in the name of the domain admin. And if the domain admin password changes, that certificate is still valid. Um, so yeah, that's, that's probably the most, the most common one that we are seeing at this point. Uh, second to uh, escalation four, which is where low privileged users have the rights to modify templates to then make them into escalation one templates. So um, it's, it's you know, a two-step process. And theoretically, if auditing is enabled, you should be able to catch it. But guess what? Nobody has auditing enabled. So um, it's still pretty bad. Yeah, and these are, these are pretty easy to pull off too, right, Jake? Because a lot of times it's the authenticated users group or domain users group that has has these rights. So, I mean, how hard is it for an attacker just to get a normal user account in the environment to then have a direct escalation point? There's another <laughs> interesting one that we're trying to track down, which is um, escalation two, which is where you can set up your own uh, subordinate certificate authority. Um, we are regularly finding ones named vSphere 6.x, hmm. VMware 6, vSphere, you know, like vSphere sub CA, like there was some document out there that was telling people to set up this uh, type of certificate and it had to have come from VMware. Like it's it's too, com too common at this point to, uh, you know, think it's anything else. But we have good news, right, Jake? Uh, I, there's a tool that we have released called what? That will help people with this. That's that great. is called Locksmith. Yes, it, it does uh, scans your environment for escalations one, two, four, five, six, and eight, with number three on the way after a request from uh, actually a guy from Red Siege, Brandon, Brandon from Red Siege. It's like, why don't you cover escalation three? I'm like, we will. Don't worry. But yeah, and that is on can, our um, GitHub, is it not, Jake? It's on our GitHub. Thank you. What's Thank that you. page again? Uh, GitHub.com/slash/trymark. Pretty simple. It's and brand again, new and I'm free. really excited about it. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, do you want um, you want more questions? Do you have any because we got we, now we got questions coming in over uh, over inside the chat too. Aside from our spreadsheet of doom that we have, um, Matt uh, Matt on the web asks: uh, Is the recommendation to enable SMB signing realistic for a large organization? Ooh. Who wants it? <laughs> I'll take that one. Yeah, the, the answer is yes, absolutely. SMB signing is is absolutely a requirement now. Uh, attackers are taking advantage of weaknesses in the SMB protocol and have for a while, uh, which include uh, NTLM relay and a bunch of other issues. Uh, that's hard. 
So we get that that's hard. One of the great things about Trimark is that the folks that are here that do work, do assessments, uh, have come from operations that have shifted over to security. And so I think on this call, uh, with the three people you're looking at right now, we have probably about 40-ish years of experience co combined, if not more, probably closer to 50, 45, 50, of operations experience, managing, working with Active Directory, working with customers around Active Directory and, and identity at, at, at large. And so what that means is we have a really good understanding of what the challenges are. So we know that uh, and we've worked with customers on this. We've seen some some good sized customers actually get signing enabled. There's a caveat to that. You have to get, uh, in order to get to signing, you also have to get some of these older systems upgraded or out of the environment. Uh, so that means no more 2003, means no more XP, means no more 2000, um, which we know can be complicated given certain environments. Um, if you have manufacturing, if you have some other things that are in that environment that are these devices or systems, I mean, we've run across a microscope that was running off an XP system that was developed by a vendor and that vendor's not around anymore. So there's no way to recode that for this specific microscope. Uh, so we understand that there's challenges there. We know that there's issues with uh, the next type devices and, and appliances on the network. So we've worked with customers through the, these things, helped uh, provide better a better phased approach to, to getting these sort of let's say vulnerabilities in the environment, mitigate it to an extent, um, but ultimately it starts with understanding uh, what you have. So it starts with auditing and you can do SMB auditing. Uh, did we do a, uh, an article about that, Scott, that covers auditing of SMB? I feel like there was something that we did that was covering that area. Was that part of the uh, channel signing or, and, or no, or uh, channel binding? It's definitely, with the LDAP, yeah, binding, binding and channel signing, we have auditing recommendations. And within that, there are actual report, we have some SMB specific auditing stuff. I don't know if we have a blog post dedicated to it though. Okay. So I would say definitely look at uh, SMB auditing and uh, get that configured across your DCs and certainly across servers if possible. So that way you can identify what client, what versions of SMB clients are, are, are squawking, talking to your, your servers and DCs. Uh, that will help you better identify what you have in the network in order to identify what capabilities you have to to move up to. Um, there's another another one that I that I really like. This is a very broad one, uh, and even I know that. And I, I I you guys have forgotten more about Active Directory than I personally will ever know. Uh, what are the recommended security configurations for an Active Directory environment? <laughs> How many do you I'll, want? I'll, I'll go first. Like, let's make sure that you know who your members of domain admins, administrators, enterprise admins are. Um, make sure there's no group nesting there and make sure that any of the accounts that are there should be there and uh, really question any accounts that are not uh, associated with a human. Uh, so you have service accounts that are in there. You should go through and know why they, they should be there or they're supposed to be there, not just because the vendor says that they have to be there. Uh, that is one of the biggest issues we see across practically every assessment is not inventorying admin accounts and not ensuring that those passwords do change. And I, I don't care what you've read, passwords should change, especially for admin accounts. Um, go and read the NIST article. We, we uh, posted an article on hub.trimarksecurity.com talking about NIST and passwords. So yes, you can ensure that passwords never change, provided that you have some caveats in place, one of which is a password filter. Um, most environments that we've seen that say, well, we don't force our users to change passwords because Microsoft and this said, you don't do that anymore. They don't have password filters in place. So there's awful passwords in this environment. And then I've worked a bunch of breaches as a subject matter expert. And guess what happens as part of a breach? Everyone's password gets force changed. Well, if you're an organization that has told users, you never have to change your password except when there's a breach, and then you have to change your password, well, you're probably going to end up publishing or getting this published in, in an article online somewhere that such and such organization was likely breached because they're changing their passwords and they don't have a policy to change them. So at a minimum, I think they should change at some point. I think just saying that passwords never changes the rules isn't a great idea, um, but I'm getting way off topic. Uh, so yeah, um, admin accounts, knowing who they are, identifying your Kerberos delegation, making sure that it's constrained and not unconstrained, um, making sure that your admin accounts and highly privileged accounts, now that you've inventoried them and know who they are, are well protected and isolated from easy access for attackers. 
and uh, Scott's going to say uh, channel binding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not as hard as it sounds. Just like, you know, Sean was talking about with SMB, turn on auditing. Like auditing is your friend with a lot of these things. If you're not, if you're unsure about, hey, what's this, you know, this configuration, this setting going to do if I implement it in my environment? Hey, look to see if there's some event correlation you can do to see if there's anything that's leveraging um, the thing that you're essentially trying to take away or are better secure. Um, yeah, but yeah, Sean hit the nail on the head, really start, start at the top, right? So yeah, who are your AD administrators? What are they doing? How are they accessing the systems? Where are their credentials? Um, yeah, it's, it's, I think we're close to like 200 specific checks that we we perform during an active directory security assessment. So it's it's difficult to say, you know, which ones should, you should focus on, really you should focus on all, all things um, AD security related. But, but I'll, I'll pass over to Jake because I'm sure he has a couple he wants to add. I, I just want to uh, get on my soapbox about the protected users group. Mm. Nobody uses it. It's there. It adds a ton of a ton of easy protections to your AD admins. At the very least, your AD admins in, should be in there. It breaks some workflows around things that your AD admin shouldn't be doing anyway. So you know, uh, yeah, it should be an easy lift. If you can't do that, I totally understand. Marking your like like Sean said, protecting your AD admins as much as possible. There is a little setting called account is sensitive and cannot be delegated. Check that box. Delegation attacks are off the table. Seems pretty simple. A Asterix for for now. <laughs> <laughs> for now, for now, right? Um, All of this for now. <laughs> yeah, there's a uh, there's quite a few questions about Kerber roasting. Uh, um, uh, there's one I I actually like this because there's there's two questions that kind of center around like tools like Bloodhound and Pink Castle and things like that. So I'm going to ask, and hopefully this answers your question, RK. But if it doesn't, let me know. How can I perform an exhaustive review of AD and Azure AD apart from tools like Pincastle and Bloodhound? Sean's got a free tool. Yeah, so we did publish a uh, PowerShell script um, summer of 2020 with an accompanying arc article specifically for Active Directory and low-hanging fruit, how to help kind of clean up these quick and easy things. So uh, I saw a couple questions about curb roasting. How do you identify these accounts that, that could be curb roastable? Um, our approach is basically looking at any account that is an Active Directory admin, so it's a member of the domain administrator group, domain admins, or enterprise admins, or any of those uh, nested groups, and it has a, a an associated Kerberos service principal name or SPIN, uh, and it has a password that is older than three years old. So that that's our approach to this. It works pretty well, generally speaking. Uh, most environments have a password policy that is about seven or eight characters long, seven being the Active Directory default. So it's really interesting when we find an environment that's set to eight, like, great, you did one more than the default. <laughs> um, bumping that up to 12 to 14 really can help mitigate uh, some of those easy password spray or, or password attacks, such as password spraying, where the attacker goes through a list of passwords and attempts to authenticate as every user using the first password, and then they sleep that tool for a little bit, and then they move on to the second one. And I think right now the new hotness is what, spring 2023 exclamation point. So um, that's probably what the passwords are. If you're using that password, I recommend you change it and uh, uh, make it a little more unique. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is to prepend a password with a symbol because most of the password uh, cracking tools don't usually do that or, or password attack tools don't usually do that. Um, but from the perspective of low hanging fruit, uh, like I said, we have the, pa uh, the PowerShell script that we released 2020 uh, with the article on hub.trimarksecurity.com. Uh, but really it's about uh, going through and, and finding these, these areas that are the easier ones to fix. I don't have a good answer for you for Azure AD. Um, Microsoft has a number of scripts that they published, but they're not really a cohesive unit for like really identifying and knowing what the, what the challenges are. I don't know, maybe, maybe we'll see what we can put together on that, but Microsoft's deprecating the, the Azure AD PowerShell modules anyway. So I don't know, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Well, how, how helpful is the secure score in Azure AD, Sean? Would that be something? I mean, we're worry? on the record here. I, 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 think it, <laughs> I think it could be more useful, uh, to be honest. I, is, I think is that, that a good starting point? 
would you say? Or? Yeah, yeah, I think it's a good starting point. I mean, certainly the and and the the big joke is which one? Um, so which secure score? Uh, I would focus on the identity one first and work through that. Um, obviously, MFA is is a big deal in Azure AD. Um, talking about things we typically see in Azure AD are use, regular user accounts that are members of highly privileged uh, roles. So the roles in Azure AD are those privileged groups uh, that, are, that Microsoft defines and sets the uh, permissions on that has those rights. So a global administrator, privileged role administrator, privileged authentication administrator, things like that, uh, making sure that there aren't regular user accounts in there. Um, Microsoft has put a very strong stance around ensuring that you're not using synchronized accounts. These are the accounts that are in Active Directory that also exist in Azure AD and are linked. Uh, not using these synchronized accounts, which is really your on-prem Active Directory account in the, the privileged roles within Azure AD. Uh, because compromise of that account in Active Directory would result in compromise of Azure AD. And what's really fun about that is oftentimes that account that's in Active Directory has no rights to Active Directory, but is highly privileged in Azure AD. Um, and we've actually mapped out some interesting things. I did a, a talk at the Quest Tech Conference last year where I was talking about the identity nexus, which is what I call this this uh, this combination or where, where these identity systems and infrastructure combine in interesting ways where we've mapped out an, an unprivileged account in Active Directory that was a member of a role in Azure AD, which had the ability to change a password for the Azure AD accounts. And again, these are all synced accounts. These are Active Directory accounts and password write back is enabled, which means that you can actually change the password for, uh, let's say, an account that's a member of VMware admins. And then once you change the uh, password for that, you now control that account on in Active Directory. That password syncs back, updates that account in Active Directory, and now you have control over VMware. And guess where domain controllers are? They're all in VMware now. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it, it gets fairly complicated. This is why things like MFA is has to be a standard, has to be required for privileged accounts in Azure AD. Um, and same thing, you got to protect those admin accounts. So don't just use your standard web browser as you used to visit Facebook or Reddit or whatever people are on today, TikTok, the, the Tiki Talks. Um, at least have something like an admin server that you RDP into and, and perform those actions from. But yeah, it's there's not a good tool right now that I'm aware of um, that would give you a, a pretty comprehensive review of Active Directory and Azure AD that would be free, free, low cost, no cost sort of situation. But it is uh, worth mentioning that, oh, real quick, Danny, that Christina's published. No, Scott, I'm just gonna keep talking over you. No, absolutely <laughs> not. I was gonna say Christina from our team has posted a couple of couple of blog articles out there that are some quick, easy wins as far as Azure AD is concerned. So that would definitely be uh a good starting point as well. Oh, now now I'm allowed to go. Now I can do this. A uh, question from Patricia R. earlier in, uh, she had one of our first questions. Thank you, Patricia. Do you have a perspective or opinion on striking a balance in a big enterprise, right, uh, between users being able to self-service but keep a somewhat centralized security model? That's a great question. Um, because that, I think, is the balance that a lot of organizations are, are trying to strike. Um, automation can be very helpful, but it's also it can be helpful and empower operations and administrators. Uh, but it can also empower the attackers, as we've seen with SolarWinds. So when an automation system has the ability to do a number of different things, that becomes something that is very enticing to an attacker. So it's got to be something where the system is set up with checks and balances and is protected if it has privileged access. So if it has the ability to workflow accounts into privileged roles, either on-prem in Active Directory or in Azure AD, um, and there's a number of provisioning systems out there that, that have this sort of capability. And then the other thing that's pretty interesting about this is when you're talking about these identity systems, you have Active Directory, you have Azure AD, you may have Okta or Ping, uh, you may have ADFS. One of the biggest challenges that I've seen is that organizations often don't understand their authentication flow. So what users, how users authenticate to the different systems and how users actually get from their on-prem system and then they open up Outlook to get access to their Exchange Online mailbox 
where they open up their web browser and then they get to Workday, for example, as a, as a cloud SaaS app. Understanding that authentication flow enables the organization to better understand what are the pieces that plug into that. So for example, if there's a uh, mobile device management system or MDM that has the ability to put certificates on that device to then flag it as compliant or managed, and then you don't require MFA for authentication that comes in from these devices, then that's an opportunity for an attacker. And I've, I've seen a breach that involved an attacker that leveraged that MDM type system. I say all this to come back to the automation and self-service of things can be attacked as well. One of the things that we have found, and actually did a talk about it, I think in um, 2017 or 2018, about attacking administration was, I found a configuration in, in a customer environment. Since then, we've seen this many times where they use a self-service portal where the users can update attributes in Active Directory, such as mobile phone, home phone, whatever. And so the interesting thing there is when organizations use a, an MFA product like Duo, um, that push or that initial uh, text message that comes through is often looking at the user's uh, user accounts associated mobile phone number. And so if the user has the ability to self-service that, then the attacker impersonating the user has the ability to uh, change that as well. So the thing that I think is probably most important when it comes to these self-service type capabilities is we tend to take something that is potentially fairly innocuous, like a mobile number, phone number, cell phone number, and then add something else to it to leverage that for security. Uh, it's kind of like what's happened in the US with social security numbers. It's supposed to be for this purpose, now it's used for identity across everything. It's just scope creep of what it's for. Um, I think a similar thing kind of happens with the mobile number or some of the other things that we end up using. So we were able to identify in a customer environment that this self-service of not password reset, but the ability to change and update attributes uh, within Active Directory led to a situation where we actually walked through and changed it, showed how this could work, changed it as impersonating the user, and because we were able to potentially get onto their system, uh, and then update it to a phone number that the attacker was controlling. And for Duo, the default is you can also do an SMS uh, request and put in the code, whereas the user can still do the pushes all day long, even though the cell phone number has been updated. Uh, so we've seen this in a number of environments, especially those with what, Scott? CyberArk. <laughs> yeah, Active Directory, <laughs> CyberArk, uh, where CyberArk is using Duo, um, and and basically you you yeah. update this 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 attribute to then to then bypass it. And there's been other other systems that that have been protected by it as well. No slight on Duo. There's definitely some configurations there, but the, when you combine and you provide the self-service capability. It's important to think about the more expanded area where what does this actually mean from an attacker perspective as well as what does this mean from an operations perspective so following right on that oh mike you could have given me a better segue operations right one of the things that we pride ourselves on that really sets trimark apart that i appreciate all of our people come from an operational background right when it comes to we don't just give you an assessment and say <laughs> look at everything that's broken we say, here are the things that you can fix. Uh, if you and, and we give you a level of effort, right? Like you have these things that are a high return, low level of effort, take care of this block and you take care of X amount of your problems. And then we score things different ways. So we come from that operational remediation. We know it's not easy and we know it takes time to do these things. One of the questions that we got, which I personally really wanted to ask is, um, uh generally ad admins don't understand the impact of remediating ad findings what is and i'm sorry it's it's written kind of weirdly but i'm gonna try what recommended what are your recommended approaches to minimize harm during remediation auditing <laughs> And if, if you have the luxury, you know, obviously starting in the lab first is always recommended, but I know yeah, that's not, not usually a possibility for a lot of organizations for whatever reason. And it's sometimes impossible to actually mimic your production environment in a lab environment. So you're not even really getting a true test. But I would say just really understanding 
you know, what it is you're actually doing. What is this setting changing and, and what devices or applications are at risk um, from this change? What about you, Jake? I was gonna lean heavily on the auditing thing as well. I mean, um, and, and say, you know, we all have a test environment. Some of us also have a prod environment. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's a matter of doing the smallest change that you possibly can. I mean, really, in your, in your, as much as you test it out, you, you still do the smallest change you possibly can. And one change at a time, right, Jake? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's what, we've all had that situation. You make three changes, something breaks, and then it takes you twice as long to figure out what, what it was. So, yeah, one change at a time, for sure. Yeah, to, to Jake's point, um, and, and Scott's as well, is, is basically phasing into that. Uh, so you um, test it out. So, for example, with protected users, don't just go ahead and throw all of your accounts that are in domain admins, administrators, and enterprise admins into protected users, uh, because then if for some reason that doesn't work, you are then going to have to log into the domain controller console to then undo that. Um, add one, test out the workflow, make sure it works fine. And we've only seen a, a few weird corner cases where protected users break something. And, and like Jake said, it's because AD admins are actually managing or logging into other systems like Tanium, uh, or they are um, using an RDP system that ultimately is using a different name than what the computer name is because they're doing DNS round robin for it. So that breaks Kerberos. Well, protected users can only use Kerberos authentication at the AES level. So if the computer name doesn't match the, that they're connecting to doesn't match the computer name of the actual computer they're connecting to, and Kerberos isn't going to work and it's going to fall back to NTLM, which isn't going to work at all because protected users blocks that. Uh, you also can't connect to things through uh, IP address because that falls back to NTLM as well. Uh, in fact, for a while there, I think Microsoft added the capability to add a spin uh, for an IP address in the 2016 timeframe. Um, I'm not exactly certain why, but prior to that, you were you were not able to. It would be NTLM only, even, even if there was a spin with that IP address. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely about stepping into it and checking to make sure that you understand what the Im impact of that is. A lot of times that means going to Google. Uh, we really work hard in our reports to both ensure that we have additional information about what this recommendation, recommendation is and why and what the potential concerns are, uh, but we also keep in contact with our customers and have feedback from them. They're like, hey, this is a little harder than we thought it would be. Can we get on the call to talk through it? We, we have those calls, we have those conversations. So we really have a good understanding of what those challenges are because our goal is to make things better. Um, we've had a customer that had nine trusts and two weeks, three weeks after the report, when we had a report delivery call with them, they said they got that nine trusts down to three because we were able to talk around what those were for, why were they configured that way? How did they get from nine to three? I seriously doubt they went and turned off all the trusts at the day they read the report. Um, what they probably did was, was start with a, a interview, a, a conversation, an inventory of what are these trusts for? Why do I have this trust that is actually connecting to this subsidiary that we sold a year ago? Um, probably don't need that trust anymore. Um, there's ways to identify if a trust is still active. So is what do we have? Is it still in place? Is it still important? What are we using it for? And okay, if I make this change, what does this mean? Uh, could it have negative impact to the user? Could it have negative impact to the system? Could it turn off? It could disrupt an application. Obviously, if if uh, you're you you know check your environment, and you go this service account has a password that's 15 years old. Okay, that first of all, that account's probably already compromised. Um, but second of all, what are the systems that 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 service account that has a service principal name or service principal names? What is it supporting? Um, and if you, if no one knows what that search account actually is doing and it's in domain admins, um, but no one wants to turn it off or disable it because they don't know what that'll break. I always ask the question, is an application truly supported if you don't know all the components that are involved in? So I would say one of the most important parts of the remediation is the discovery, is the inventory, is understanding the system and the configuration um, I think our reports are pretty good at doing that, but I also think a lot of customers that we've worked with 
um, have some good documentations, uh, good documentation, but one of the things that I've definitely noticed is as soon as you write it, things change. Um, and so updating that documentation be challenging as well. Um, got another question uh, internally actually here. Um, uh, you, you guys had mentioned one change at a time. Um, I I come from like a threat hunter background, so I've never been a sysadmin. I recognize that like you can't just click everything and be like, all right, let's go do this. Um, but it makes it difficult, right, to get things moving in these environments. For forget about enterprises, like even like the smaller mom and pop shops, everything moves slowly. So, how do we at Trimark uh, help organizations prioritize the things, right? So they get the highest possible impact with a minimum level of effort where they can save their energy for the big stuff later but still get a return sooner so i'm i'm going to slightly adjust that question i'm going to say what how could reports be structured so that they are helping the customer better understand what to do first second and third and what are the things that we've heard from customers that they really like that provides them the information that they feel they need in order to better leverage their minimal resources that they have available And I'll kick it to Scott. Uh, I thought you were also going to answer the question too, Sean. Not yet. <laughs> we didn't bring you here just for your pretty face, Scott. <laughs> that was a lot of it, but it wasn't all of it. Yeah, I mean, I think it all comes down to understanding the actual risk, you know, that's associated with each priority. And then, you know, the, the, the extra special thing that we do is, is have that level of effort or, you know, We've done the research, we've been administrators before, we know how difficult it would be to actually go about remediating this. Um, so for us, obviously, you're, you need to tackle the most severe things, your critical findings, the things that have known attack vectors, whether those are a low level of effort or a medium level of effort, because that, that's a, a direct path to compromise your entire AD environment. Um, and then from there, it's yes, really, you know, we've, we have an internal process where we go through each one of our checks and each one, one of our findings to say, okay, hey, you know, at face value, how big of a deal is this? And then also, is there anything outside of this check, you know, through some other check that could impact this and make this a bigger deal than it, than it is, you know, right? Maybe taking three findings together, you know, when you, when you combine them, you know, this turns into a, a big deal. And then, and then you're essentially tackling each one of those findings separately. Um, to mitigate. So, yeah, for it's it's a really good question, risk, and you know how to go about doing it. But we, you know, we've tried to simplify it down to, hey, this is a severe thing with a rather easy level of effort. So this is this is where we want you to start because this is going to have the biggest impact, you know, from a positive impact on your environment from a security perspective. Does that? I have, I have an example of that in Active Directory, which is, you know, we see unconstrained delegation in an environment, and then we see Prince Spooler running on a domain controller, you know, separately, they're both bad, but you combine them both and they are now a critical issue. And we will point that out and say, hey, take care of probably just turning up the Prince Spooler, getting rid of all your unconstrained delegation is going to be more difficult. But you do that Prince Spooler and, you know, that second finding is much less of a priority. So. Yeah, and I think the context is really important, providing the context around why is this an issue? Um, I think too often security reports in the industry have been just data dumps, uh, a Qualys scan report, uh, what have you. And those aren't useful because, sure, it's good to know what the issues are, mm -hmm. but if you don't really know what you're supposed to do with that, um, things don't get done. That report just stays on the shelf um, because no one has time to go through and go to Google or maybe BARD now and start typing in, uh, questions around like, okay, what is the impact if I change this? What is the impact that if I change this and start researching to figure out, okay, what are these things that I need to do? If I have 50 high priority findings in this assessment report, what should I work through first? How should I work through that? How should I start? Um, so something more granular, like what we do, tying that to approximate level of effort, or at least things that really have high impact in the environment, because an attacker will take advantage of this issue if they can get to it but the the way to resolve that is fairly low. And from what we've seen, at least anecdotally, over half of the high priority findings have a low level of effort, which means they can be resolved in a couple of weeks. Um, so that provides tremendous value, but 
going back to the question, so I didn't want to make it like Trimark is great because we do these things. I wanted to make it more about providing information to the community, which is the purpose of these calls, is you know, ensuring that when we talk about something in a report, we can explain why that is. If we say that this account is Kerberostable, what does that mean? I'm an admin, I've been an admin 15 years. I don't care what that means. I just need to know what I need to do with that so I can go and fight these five fires that I have to do because security threw this over the fence to me and now I got to figure out these Kerberosable accounts. <laughs> uh, and then the other part of it is if I know that there's uh, of the 50 admins, 80 admins that are out there, uh, half of them have passwords that are older than 10 years. Okay, and half of those are service counts. Like I got to track those down and figure that out. How am I supposed to do that? Um, what is the priority there? What should I work on first? And I think those sort of things are really important, especially when it comes to a pen test or a red team report. And uh, companies like Red Siege and, and uh, Black Hills and Trusted Sec are, have been around for a while, have also kind of captured on that and, and shown that, hey, these are the things that will really map to what the issues are, but also how to fix this. And I think the other part of it that's really important to, to capture as, into that is, a report that says disable NTLM, go Kerberos only is not useful at all because Microsoft can't even do that. Like Microsoft says you still need NTLM right now. It's not dead yet. So you can't just disable that. That means that we need to provide better information around how to mitigate it. Uh, we were talking earlier on an internal call about like making recommendations around this is a good way to do this. This would be a better way to do this. This is the right. best way to do that. And we have some of that captured uh, today, but I think it's it's continue to strive to be better, continue to figure out how to better prepare things and present things in ways that are consumable by the person reading the report and figuring out what do I need to do now? Um, because when the executive gets it, they're gonna go, okay, first of all, how do we rate to others? How bad is it really? That's question number two. And the it's third bad. one is, what do we need to do today? What are the things we need to do today? And certainly, there's gonna be environments where multiple changes are gonna to have to happen at the same time. It's just, if they can be at least be grouped together by like password changes and you know Kerberos delegation and some of the other things, so those can at least be handled by category instead of just sweeping changes within the same day because as any admin knows, you make a bunch of changes at one time, what broke it, so. So there's a, there's a second and a semi-third part of this question, but before I do that, um, now, I've never done this before, so I'm going to assume this is going to work. We have a poll that I'm yeah. going to launch in the chat. When I tried to launch it earlier, your video disappeared. I don't know if that happened for the attendees or just me, but um, it, it is a poll about uh, um, if you've ever gotten any kind of assessment. So I'm going to launch that, and we're going to see what happens. While I do that, we were talking just about that last question about um, how to get that bang for your buck. Is mm -hmm. that any different? between an Active Directory and an Azure AD? And a follow-up question to that is like, is um, how do you assess um, AD Connect configuration? So does everything you just said change or is there examples you can give that are different between AD and Azure AD? No, I think the remediation steps and evaluation of what needs to get done is the same. Um, I mean, as I said, we've assessed companies from the Fortune 5 all the way out to, you know, uh, smaller uh, uh, nonprofits, et cetera. And the quick poll did take the screen, but that's fine. So just go ahead and click through that. Whoops. Um, <laughs> Sorry. No, you, but, you, you keep talking. I, like, I'll, yeah, I'll give them yeah, about absolutely. two minutes to answer. You're doing the absolutely. best you so, can. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> new platform, so we're, we're testing it out. So we'll see how this goes. Uh, but yeah, it, it comes down to uh, the same sort of things, identifying what needs to be done, identifying what the resources are uh, and, and a lift that's associated with that, as well as determining uh, how hard that's gonna be, what is the impact gonna be to the system, the users, et cetera. I think uh, generically that's enough of, of a step at looking at it to figure out what should be done, how do we do that? And then the other part of that, the other part of the question was Azure AD Connect. So as part of our Active Directory security assessment, look at Azure AD, Connect, Azure AD Connect from the Active Directory standpoint, like where is it running on? What server or servers is it running on? What service account is it using in Active Directory? Uh, what are the rights that that service account has? Uh, how could an attacker compromise that? As I said earlier, uh, Black Hat last year, I talked to some of my friends who are red teamers and they said Azure AD Connect and Active Directory Certificate Services are the two systems, two, two things they use 
uh, most successfully in order to compromise uh, Active Directory. So we look at it from that perspective from an Active Directory security assessment. From an Azure AD security assessment, we are looking at uh, the configuration of Azure AD Connect from the Azure AD side, from that tenant. So what is the version? Is it an older version? Is it still running on 1.x? If so, it's gotta be up to, upgraded to two uh, because Microsoft deprecated that back in August of last year, uh, the version one. Uh, we're looking at what integration components are there. Is it pass-through authentication or PTA, Azure AD seamless single sign-on, uh, federation, how are these things configured? Is uh, password hash synchronization enabled? Horrible name that Microsoft gave it because it's not the password hash, it's a hash. Multiple hashes of the actual password hash that is then associated with the account in Azure AD. Um, apparently, uh, uh, in a story, uh, Dr. Azure AD just did a, a, a uh, presentation recently or is about to where he's talking about how he was he figured out how to pull hashes uh, from these uh, these synchronized hash, hashes from password hash synchronization, which is run through multiple, multiple times. So you can't just go back uh, from the, um, you can't, can't go back from the hash that's there to what the password is. That's that's the whole purpose of the hash. Uh, but it's interesting that he was able to figure out how to pull that. Um, but we look to see if password hash synchronization is enabled. We think it should, Microsoft says it should. Uh, one of the biggest reasons for this is because if there is a, dump a data dump from a website breach or web app breach where uh, the username, the email address uh, for the for the business as well as the associated password was was compromised and put into that. And that happens to be the same credentials used to log into Azure AD. Um, if the password hash is synchronized, then Microsoft can flag that and let you, let you know that this account is vulnerable. And depending on your subscription level could even set it so that the password has to be changed or some other action happens automatically. So uh, very nice feature. Plus, there's also a way that if your Active Directory environment is experiencing some huge challenge, like on a ransomware, you can flip a bit, and then your primary authentication method is Azure AD. Users can still log into their email, still connect to at least some resources, their collaboration system, potentially if you're using Teams or Yammer, and then continue working at some level, uh, accessing their cloud applications, potentially, while everyone's working on the on-prem AD environment. All right, we got Yammer. Like people are going to use Yammer. <laughs> Microsoft does. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, let's see. We got. Oh my God, we have so many different questions left. We got about seven minutes left. Let's fit one more in until we do like a closing thoughts kind of thing. Um, sure. So Michael asks because I've heard you guys talk a lot about like PIM and PAM and stuff like that. Uh, apologies if I missed any discussion. Uh, I got pulled away. What's the best way to handle PAM these days? I work at a large financial institution, lots of on-prem resources still. Is ESAE slash Red Forest still the way to go? An Azure solution, PIM slash PAM, third-party solution? Question mark. I'd like to hear Scott and Jake, and then I'll add my two cents. <laughs> I, I don't have anything I can throw in on. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, haven't seen one that's been... I mean, unless you're ton spending tons of management time, it, it, it's all. It seems like it's always bad. I think we've seen maybe two or three organizations successfully, you know, deploy and manage, you know, a red forest or an admin forest. Um, I I think you really have to be at a certain level before you should even start considering you know, moving and, and moving in that direction. I think there's a lot of other things that you need to address first before even um, talking about going down that route. And I think the same thing applies for, for a PAM solution, you know, like CyberArk. I think there's a lot of other wins you need in your environment before you then say, okay, PAM will get us to that next step. Because I think a lot of organizations, at least of what we see, they throw PAM and they're like, okay, we just solved our, you know, AD administration problem you know we don't have, have to worry about these accounts getting compromised anymore and, and that's just not true because um, there's a lot of other considerations that go into play so I, I would actually like to see you know password filter solutions privilege access workstations before the PAM discussion even you know enters the conversation yeah I, I building on that Scott is, that's hitting the nail on the head the proverbial nail on the head exactly because we've seen plenty of organizations that have gotten cyber arc 
or have a Red Forest. And basically the check was signed for CyberArk or Microsoft to deploy the Red Forest and we're like, we're done. Well, just because you shifted your AD administration out of Active Directory, quote unquote, into another system, doesn't mean that you don't have issues with delegation, you don't have issues with other other accounts that have rights through either through permissions in Active Directory or through uh, group policy user rights assignments or through any number of ways that, that uh, things can be configured and, and delegated within Active Directory that provides rights to something uh, or service counts. Service counts are pretty much always still there. And if those passwords aren't managed by say, something like CyberArk or Secret Server, that's, that's a vulnerability. That's an issue in the environment. Um, I would say that uh, it's not often that we've seen a Red Forest managed a, a environment production of Act Directory Forest where all the corporate users and, and computers are that we haven't found uh, major issues in it. Um, again, just because you're shifting administration over to the admin force doesn't mean that your Act Directory security issues that have been uh, put in there over years have been solved. Um, and I wanna, I wanna make a point also, I heard in the past year that someone said Active Directory was inherently insecure. It's not. It's the same level of security as many of these systems are, just like VMware and, and others, where you can configure the system to your heart's content, um, just like you can drive a car down a street at 60 miles an hour in a, in a 15 mile an hour zone. Like this, the, the system itself is gonna stop you from doing things that are boneheaded that will cause problems like adding adding all your users in Active Directory to the domain admins or administrators group, like that's gonna be problematic, likely. Um, but yeah. you can do that. Uh, you can make these decisions. Uh, they are probably going to work out not so great for you. Um, but I think Scott's right. Like Pam is part of the solution. Uh, maybe Pam is just the beginning of the things that need to be looked at. And I think that certainly using a tool like Purple Knight, uh, using a tool like Bloodhound, using a tool like Pincastle, uh, the PowerShell script that we publish using a tool like uh, Locksmith uh, that Jake published, these are these are tools that help provide some visibility and some uh, raise the the issues as these are problems these need to be worked on. Uh, the great point right there is you can go ahead and move to the Red Force, but if you still have Active Directory certificate services uh, and you haven't looked at it since I don't know the past two years, I'd say probably with 95%, 99% certainty that that environment's vulnerable and could be compromised today. Uh, okay, we are running up on time. We just got a comment, not a question. 6 a.m. in New Zealand, an amazing talk to start the day. Many thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thank you, Richard. All right. Right. Out and good day. In New Zealand. So yeah, we are up at the end of our, yeah, there's, we still have so many, and but don't worry, like we're gonna answer them, all right? Like I'm in charge of we're the- We're gonna content. do a part two. Yeah, we're gonna do a part two. And I'm I'm the one that like cracks, cracks them for content and stuff. So I, we're, we're not gonna forget these. We're gonna make, because the reason that we do these things, again, not to show, it is we wanna give back. You have questions, we have answers. That's what we're here for. So we have another webinar coming up in June with our very own uh, Demetrius Moustakis on uh, VMware, uh, VMware vSphere, um, and saving the marriage between Active Directory and VMware because one gets popular, one goes down to. Uh, I'm really excited for that. That's gonna be more like a, uh, it's gonna be a myself and D. We're gonna be doing like a interview style. We got a hell of a war story to tell you uh, at the end. I, I should be looking at the camera, not looking into my microphone. Um, and if you want, so we have a bunch of content. Uh, we love putting that stuff out. My, my people do an amazing job, hub.trimarksecurity.com. And uh, if you did see this little shilling, um, and you are interested in one of our assessments, uh, trimarksecurity.com slash services. You can always follow us on Twitter, uh, twitter.com slash trimarksecurity. We do a uh, live Twitch stream every Friday on twitch.tv slash trimarksecurity. Uh, we have uh, sub T is coming up. Uh, Casey John Ellis from Bug Crowd. Uh, we got, uh, oh, Carlos Perez is this Friday. So a man needs no introduction, much like the man Sean Metcalf himself. So we got a lot going on. Uh, we have a newsletter you can sign up for. Like it, it's all right there, and we update you on everything, especially via uh, the newsletter. So before and, we and I will going, add, based on the poll results, uh, very very few people or organizations have gotten a VMware security assessment. So definitely tune in for the webcast next month with D talking about how to better secure VMware. Free information for you here from Trimark. 
Yep. And that sign up is uh, on our uh, Twitter account. I think it's our pinned tweet. Uh, so it's twitter.com slash Trimark Security. LinkedIn, we're, we're all over the place. And we uh, obviously, we love answering this stuff. So uh, thank you, Jake. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Sean. Any last thoughts from either of you? Check no. your admins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. Them. Hey, you know what? I, I, how dare I ask them for more thoughts? They just talked for an hour straight. I, <laughs> They need to rest and get snacks. So thank you to everybody in the audience. We appreciate it. Uh, and we will uh, talk to you again soon. See you in June. Thanks, Tom. Right. Later on.